The last time we spoke to our next guest, he was in the home of a revenge porn mogul trying to convince him of the error of his ways. Now he's at it again, this time inviting a group of elite hackers into his life to find out how easy it was to infiltrate it. Turns out that for Kevin, like many of us, it wasn't that difficult. Welcome Kevin Roos of Fusion. Thank you for having me. So why did you do this? Well, uh, A is I'm a glutton for punishment. I always like to put myself in the middle of, of my stories. Um, and I, uh, I had reported on a lot of big hacks of major companies like Sony Pictures and JP Morgan. And I had heard about this thing that companies do called penetration testing or pen testing, where they invite hackers in, um, white hat hackers, to hack their systems and help them figure out what the vulnerabilities are and where they might you know, have security flaws and how hackers who are malicious and want to do damage might find their way into their systems. And uh, and this is a big industry. I mean, there are pen testers who charge tens of thousands of dollars an hour. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I should have one of these. Like maybe there's a personal pen test that I could do because I'm pretty privacy conscious and I want to keep my information secure. And so what if I invited hackers to do the same thing to me that, you know, Fortune 500 companies are getting done to them. So I had two hackers, um, this guy Chris Hadnagy and this guy Dan Tentler, um, sort of spend two weeks hacking me using all of the tools at their disposal because I wanted to see how far they could get. Um, and at the end of it, I, I just made them promise that they wouldn't steal any money or do anything irreparably damaging to me. And then I wanted them to help me fix my problems and make myself more secure. So th that was going to be my later question. You made them promise. Like, are, are you a little bit scared now that they have all this information that they're not going to keep their promise? Well, I think these are both pretty ethical guys. I mean, they both have a pretty long track record of being good sort of white hat hackers. But yeah, that was absolutely a worry. I had, I had never met either Chris or Dan before. I had only heard about them, you know, sort of by reputation. And they really could have done a ton of damage. I mean, I, I was... I, in in hindsight, I kind of don't know what I was thinking by doing this. <laughs> so so what did you find were your biggest vulnerable spots? Well, one thing that was interesting is that um, Chris did what's called social engineering on me. So social engineering is sort of like hacking a network by exploiting human vulnerabilities rather than like vulnerabilities in code or or sort of infosec. Um, so he actually had one of his... Um, one of his hackers call my phone company, my cell phone company, pretending to be my wife. Um, I don't have a wife, I'm not married, but they pretended to be my wife. And they um, said, you know, we need access to Kevin's account. We need to make some changes. You know, I'm, I'm and she actually did this in a really amazing and convincing way um, using a YouTube video with some sound effects of a baby crying in the background, sort of to make the customer service rep more sympathetic. Um, and so, you know, in a matter of minutes, like she had convinced this cell phone, you know, service rep to let her into my account and let her make changes to my account and let her change my password. So it was really a, an amazing example of how you can hack someone even without hacking them directly by focusing on the companies and the organizations that give them services. Yeah, I definitely recommend watching the whole video. It was amazing to watch this. Um, this woman was a hacker. Or was she also an actress? No, she's a, she's just a hacker. I mean, she's very good at it. I mean, it requires a little bit of acting skills. But I think that's sort of the, the point is that, you know, no matter how um, secure I am, no matter how many, you know, layers of encryption I use, no matter how strong my passwords are, if the data providers that I rely on um, aren't safeguarding my information against social engineering tactics like this. Um, it doesn't matter what I do um, because I'm still vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing the information that she was able to get from this customer service rep. I'm totally going to use a YouTube video of a baby crying next time I call Comcast or anyone just to get what I need because it's, you know, I think that they were going to give her anything just to make the baby stop crying. So, so totally. what, what about the more hardcore hacking uh, that was done that, that didn't involve just, you know, people convincing someone on the phone? So this was a guy named Dan Tentler, who's a pretty well-known sort of white hat hacker. And he actually does sort of skilled technical hacking. Um, and so he started off his hack by phishing me. He um, posed as 
uh, Squarespace um, and got me to install a certificate on my machine that um, I thought was coming from Squarespace, but it was actually malware that he had written that gave him access to essentially my entire machine. Um, he set up what's called a shell um, that let him run commands remotely on my laptop. And so he was then able to steal all my passwords and install a key logger and set up uh, a, a script that took pictures of me out of my own webcam every two minutes and uploaded them to a remote server. So he was like able to spy on me, get any information I had, um, steal all my bank account information, all my credit card information. Um, I mean, he really like, this was the sort of scorched earth hack uh, to end all hacks. So when you got the email from Squarespace, I mean, this was after you had already hired them to hack you. Did you think maybe this was the, or did you, did you really just say, oh, okay, this looks legit. I'm going to answer it. I mean, I, it was very convincing. I, I, maybe I should have been uh, more skeptical. I know, you know, certainly now looking back on it, like I'm sort of, astounded that this worked. But I think, you know, at the time it felt like um, this came from, I mean, he had registered a domain, he had set up a, a custom site, like it, it all looked pretty believable. And I'm, I'm like a fairly skeptical guy. I don't, you know, respond to Nigerian princes asking for money on, you know, in my email. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's very good at his job. And so I think, you know, what we've learned is that sort of even people who are sophisticated around security can fall for these phishing scams. I mean, a, a, a Snapchat executive just fell for a phishing mm -hmm. scam the other day and compromised a bunch of employee data that way. So it's not just like grandmas that are falling for these things. So do you ever look at like the whole FBI, Apple debate about encryption and think like, uh, who cares? Like we're all vulnerable all the time anyway. If someone really wants our stuff, they'll get it no matter how secure our enclave is. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that's one of the big lessons of this experiment for me was that if someone has the time and the resources and the will to do damage um, and the skill, um, it's very, very hard to stop every possible vector of attack. Um, so if someone like Dan Tentler decides he wants to ruin your life and he's going to dedicate, you know, a month and thousands of dollars worth of, you know, equipment and energy and time to it, um, there's very little you can do to stop it. The, the bigger risk and the thing I think is happening with the Apple debate is um, is more like, you know, locking the doors of your car. Like it's a pretty common sense thing and it's going to deter, you know, 90 percent of possible thieves. It's not it won't keep everyone out, but you're much safer locking your car than you are not locking your car. And so that's how I sort of think about privacy now and security is what can I do that is is going to make it is going to deter the sort of average hacker um, and make them move on to a harder target rather than like, how can I bulletproof myself entirely? So what can we do? Well, one of the things you mentioned is using a password manager, obviously, like for most people, that's a pretty easy step. And I also have gotten recommendations to use uh, VPNs whenever you're on a public Wi-Fi network. Um, I use one called VPN Unlimited. I think it's like five bucks a month. Um, and it lets me sort of like, you know, secure my connection when I'm on um, Starbucks Wi-Fi or something like that. Um, there's also sort of, you know, common sense things, not clicking on strange links and emails. You can hover over a link in an email to make sure it actually leads to the, the address, the URL of the site you want to visit. Um, there are other sort of like one program that Dan Tentler recommended is called Little Snitch, um, which is sort of a an outgoing, um, it monitors your outgoing traffic um, to see if your computer is trying to connect to any strange servers and if any applications are trying to um, send your data elsewhere. It sort of monitors your network and allows you to stop that. Um, so there are all these little tools. And then I think just the... Um, the basic sort of like, you know, 101, security 101 tips still apply. Um, but that's, I mean, that's that's really like what most of us can do pretty easily. Obviously, if you're Edward Snowden, you'd want to like take additional precautions. But I think that was the other lesson is that most of us are not Edward Snowden. Most of us aren't 
sort of interesting or high profile enough for people to want to hack. And it's what's called like privacy through obscurity. Right. And what about the post-it note over the camera? Do you do that on, on your laptop now? I do. As you can see, I'm not doing it right now. <laughs> this uh, is still <laughs> photographing me. But after this interview, I will will tape up my computer again. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. I appreciate your vulnerability about being so vulnerable. And all of us are, uh, but not all the time. You can watch the video on Fusion at Real Future TV. You can watch all of Kevin's videos and all of Real Future TV's uh, videos. They're, this is part eight in the series, I think. Yes. And so what are some of the other, I know we interviewed about you, about the revenge porn mogul who changed his tune after you talked to him. Uh, what mm -hmm. are some of your other videos that you've done uh, on this series? Well, today we've got one coming about cryonics, which is this very uh, sort of wacky futurist movement that thinks that we should freeze people in liquid nitrogen after they die and then bring them back with futuristic medical technologies. Um, we've got stuff on biohacking. We've got stuff on drone racing. So they're all up. You can see them all at uh, realfuture.tv. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Take care.